Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. <laughs> Cruising your way on this episode of Off 90. We tour a museum that celebrates Polish heritage in Winona. We talk to an artist from Rochester who works with a challenging physical obstacle. And we learn about an unorthodox religious group in Northfield. It's all just ahead, Off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. Everybody knows that the populations in early towns in Minnesota were mostly made up of immigrants to the United States, and Winona was no exception. In the 19th century, a large segment of Winona's population was originally from Poland. The mission of the Polish Cultural Institute and Museum in Winona is to collect and exhibit the heritage of the Polish culture. Purebred Poles are difficult to find nowadays, but Polish blood probably courses in smaller amounts through more than half of the city's population. When people usually get to the museum, they are taken aback by the size of it, by the sheer amount of stuff that we have. And that's why on a lot of travel websites, they're calling it Winona's Hidden Gem. This guy right here, number 20. I'm Father Paul Breza. I'm a priest for the Diocese of Winona, so I've been sent and stationed at different areas, Blooming Prairie, Mankato, Rochester. And I was gone from Winona for basically about 48 years. But all that while, I kept in touch with Winona, and especially the Polish community. And uh, I began to realize that history was an important thing in Winona, but not any Polish history. Yeah, we have history. So somebody better start saving this before it's too late. The reason why Polish people came here to start with is unknown. That's lost to history. And that's part of the reason why I needed to start saving that, because we were losing history quickly. We had a lot of history in Polish, but we're now five generations removed. The only thing we can piece together is the fact that there were some jobs here with the sawmills, and they were hiring, they needed a lot of help. And we are the same climate and water area, lakes and rivers and hills, and the same trees, same mushrooms that we have in Poland as we have here. So by the 1870s is when the mass emigration from Poland to immigration to the States took place. And in the 70s, 6,000 Polish people left an area 25 miles in diameter which is quite small, and moved across the Atlantic and settled in an area 25 miles in diameter right here. Well, I think it's important for this history to be preserved just because it, it's in such decline and it's declining so fast that if this place wasn't around here, this town would no longer be Polish. You know, people wouldn't have any sort of idea of their forefathers, where they came from, what they did for a living. We had this language barrier. So when we came over here, that's why we all settled together in one area, close to the sawmill where the work was. But uh, you couldn't get a job selling things, you couldn't answer the phone, couldn't answer the door. You couldn't do anything that you would have to be qualified for. So you couldn't be a school teacher, you couldn't be a storekeeper, you couldn't be anything except someone who could take directions by visual. Here, put this over here. That kind of job you could do. 
So we stack lumber, took lumber away from the saw blades, you know. The reason why this, a lot of this history was lost was when the immigrants first started coming over here, and, and even in the later years, um, they didn't teach Polish to their children. They wanted to, their kids to be as Americanized as possible. So when the parents or grandparents passed and you have children that don't speak the Polish language and you get all these artifacts, you know, they're, they're basically worthless to them, so they began throwing them away. And from the very beginning, from the very start of the museum, there were boxes outside of the door, people donating stuff, and you will take anything, basically Polish-related, we'll take. The collection started by people bringing things in, or me going out to rubbish barrels, picking them up. Well, there was a uh, librarian that came from Poland one time and archived just the books that I had and was totally impressed because I have probably 30 books where there's, there might be two or three copies of those in the whole world. And there's five books that no one else has any place. So uh, just because you saved them and they were from such a small area. Okay, in here, this used to be a vault. And uh, we now have our dolls that people donate. We run on volunteers. We don't charge to get in because I always thought that the concept of the museum was we're saving the history of people who were poor when they made the history. You know, I got the stuff free. I'd like to have it for free. This was donated and it cranks up. I came to work here because we needed people to work and I wanted to do something for the museum to give back to my Polish people, her the heritage. So I just decided that's what I was going to do when I retired. The description of us in Poland from 200 years ago, even before we started to move here and here, is that we are persistent to a fault. You never ever give up, ever, for anything. and. Uh, gets you in a lot of trouble because you don't know when to quit. I tried to have something in this museum and this business that could make sense out of that Polish spirit. Father Brisa uh, received the Cavalier Cross, which happened uh, two or three years ago, and that's actually the highest civilian honor that uh, a Pole can get and he was presented it by the Chicago Council uh, from the president of Poland, which was really cool, and it, in appreciation of him keeping up with the history of, of Polish Winona, basically. It's nice for people to come through and actually be able to not just see a tractor, but to be able to see who the tractor belonged to, you know, what it was used for, what farm it was on, whether it was in Winona or Dodge County, Pickwick, and any of those things. like. We're a museum less about artifacts and more about the story behind the artifacts. They'll come in and, and kind of be awestruck because how'd you put all that together? The kids who've worked with me uh, would say, did you have a plan before you started so you would know it would end with this? No. Uh, you would get something, then you had to figure out where it would go and how it would fit, but still make sense out of what you had. What I hope for the future for preserving the Polish Museum would be that more people recognize this place for what it truly is, for the, the hidden beautiful gem that Winona actually has in, in, in the museum itself and in, in the people that work here. We're extremely friendly. Uh, that's one of the Polish things. <laughs> Friendliness is our number one priority, basically. And I, I just hope that we, we can keep, keep growing, keep expanding. I don't want to see it come to an end. Robert Rees is an artist living in Rochester. He's a painter. But Robert is living with a physical condition that is a big obstacle to his art. He's losing his eyesight. Although he won't go totally blind, Robert's eyesight is severely impaired. Robert remains undaunted. 
There might be some changes to his painting style, but Robert continues to pursue his passion for art. I always have liked art. I had no really early training. Uh, when I was in school, <laughs> we didn't have things like art. During the Depression, we moved a lot. I would never establish any relationships, so I relied upon my art to be my friend. I imagined a lot of things. I would try to draw them. It was my outlet, <clears throat> and I guess that's why I really got into art and liking it. My dad's life pretty much has been revolving around art as long as I can remember. It's his business, his hobbies, his enjoyment. When I got into middle age, and I got into uh, actually designing interiors of stores and discovered my art then was an integral part of the business because I was in that business for, oh, 45 years. My relationship with art today is, is a, uh, it's a necessary factor for me to exist. It just gives me a feeling I can do something, I hate to sound pompous, but I can do something a lot of other people can't. I think art's opened up a huge world as far as uh, his way to share with others. I like it when he does the fall, the reds and golds in the pictures. I like that it gives him the sense of um, taking him away of something he's doing that he can be proud of. I think he's very talented. My dad um, has always involved his family in his art, kind of building a little community through his, with his children because we're all touched in, with the art. I have a lighthouse of a place called Portland Head in Maine, which I always like because of the wave action. Um, it's always been one of my favorites. My favorite where I Rochester painting is of the Mayo and Gonda Clinic buildings and the, uh, with the church in the foreground. He's always been a very detailed painter and he's had to lose that and he, it's hard for him to accept that. I first started to realize my, when my eyesight was changing is when I went to get a, a new pair of glasses. And the optometrist, he said, your eyes are changing. And he looked at me and he said, you know, he said, you got macular and he said, you got uh, glaucoma. And he said, uh, you're not gonna go blind. He says, but your eyesight is gonna gradually fail. The difference between macular and, and uh, glaucoma is with one, you have peripheral vision but no center vision. With the other one, you have center vision and no peripheral. But there are those times when he's frustrated with not getting it right. And you can tell the frustration is, it's been hard to watch, it's been hard to witness. I've always painted with a lot of um, intensity and uh, preciseness, and uh, I can't do that anymore. Oh, it's been, um, probably about 10 years. You could just see the progression of his artwork. Just change, just uh, losing detail, losing accuracy, kind of becoming a little softer instead of sharp. My brush doesn't lay down where I want it to lay down. He says, maybe I should give it up. Things have got to change. I've got to fix this, and, and it's got to get better. And he wants it to, to be perfect. I've just tried to convince him and talk to him that just uh, look at the colors and put down the colors he sees. I've gone into a thing called layering, which I do layers. I do the backgrounds and I do things on top of it. We're not a patient, patient family and we have learned that. Dad has learned that he has to be patient with himself and just take things as they come. It's, uh, it's, it still gives me a, a feeling of creativity. That's his time to get away. And it, it takes him away, takes him to the places he's painting or thinking. He's a very stubborn person, and 
this is not going to stop him. He'll find a way to, co to create. I, I feel good about it. Thousands of years ago, Druids were the mystical religious leaders of the European tribes called Celts. Hardly a trace of their religion survives today. In the last half of the 20th century, a group of students from Carleton College in Northfield revived the religion of the Druids. We traveled to Northfield to learn about this group and what it means to be a modern Druid. So uh, this is all part of the RDNA, which is the Reformed Druids of North America, which was founded here at Carleton in 1963. Well, I didn't, I didn't have Druid robes. I didn't, well, I did have a beard. <laughs> what is a Druid? Um, there are as many definitions as there are Druids. I think that's probably the best definition. In many other campuses, they would be called pagans or Wiccans or neo-pagans or neo-Wiccans. I mean to include all of the European branches. I don't observe Druidry as a commitment, um, as like, it's not a religion to me as much as it's just a, a way of seeing the world. And so I think with that regard, it'll stay with me for the rest of my life. I'm Mark Hyman, I'm uh, part of the web team here at Carleton these days, but uh, I was a student at Carleton back in the 1980s. I don't call myself a Druid, but uh, I've had a lot of friends who were Druids here at Carleton, and I'm kind of an interested observer. I'm really fascinated by, by religion, and especially how students confront religion and think about religion. Ultimately, a Druid is someone who is on a path of religious exploration, which has at its core a, uh, a reverence for nature. It's about as pithy as I can be. <laughs> uh, and the word druid, we think, comes from like knowledge of the oak, because they would gather in these oak groves, and uh, like they, they had this kind of like spiritual connection to the forest. Well, the story starts in the 1960s here at Carleton uh, when the college had a religious attendance requirement, which meant that students had to go to some kind of a religious service and not only go to it, but they had to get documentation that they went. They had to have somebody sign a slip that said so-and-so was at this service on this, this, this time, and they had to turn those into the college to make sure that uh, they'd kept up the attendance requirement. And there were a lot of students as the, uh, as the 60s were uh, getting started, who felt that this was a little bit overbearing, a little bit too, uh, too parental, perhaps, and, uh, and were looking for ways to creatively protest this requirement. And uh, a group of students came up with this notion of, if we are required by the, uh, by the college to go to an organized religious service every week, what if we organized it ourselves? What if we what if we uh, made a protest that called into question the very nature of organized religion and forced the college to define what it meant by organized religion? And so a, a small group of students sat down to figure out, okay, what can we do? What, how, what, what sort of a, a religion can we invent that we would be happy to attend? Because we've got to go every week. That's part of the deal. Uh, and the origin of the name Druid is actually kind of a joke because one of the students who, who was part of the founding group was uh, from a Jewish household and uh, he, he said that uh, his parents often wrote down Druid when they were filling out forms that required them to put their religion because they didn't, they didn't feel like putting down Jewish uh, uh, on government forms and the rest of the students thought that was really great. The problem was none of them knew anything about Druids. So they thought, well, let's call ourselves the Reformed Druids because then we won't have to uh, actually do any historical research and figure out what the original Druids did or believed. So the Reformed Druids of North America was the group that they invented uh, as their uh, fulfillment for their religious attendance requirement. And so they went out into the Carleton Arboretum and uh, they read through some rituals that they had written up and they, uh, they communed with nature 
And they did this every week. And then they filled out the slip that said they had attended this religious service and they turned it into the dean's office and they hoped for the best. I am Bardwell Smith. I've taught my whole career at Carleton College. I came here in 1960. I retired in 95. Uh, I am 89 years of age and I have gr grown along with Carleton in ways that are, for me, uh, wondrous and, and very joyful. Bardwell Smith was uh, something of a key player in this whole Druid story, whether or not he realized it at the time. Um, he was here on campus as a professor of religion, and he was also the advisor of the Episcopal student group uh, from whom several of the, the student founders of Druidism came. Uh, to, tell, to hear him tell the story, I think it was with some encouragement from, from Bardwell that, uh, that those students actually embarked on this protest and, uh, and formed, formed the Druids as a way to, uh, to protest the religious attendance requirement. People used to come to the chapel on Sunday mornings when we still had a requirement. And the chaplain, David Maitland, was a wonderful person. And his, his sermons were great. And he often had get, guest speakers who were also equally good. But people were reading the comics. I mean, students came in reading the comics. And that was a, a, a soft core or um, kind of playful way of saying, look, we're here, we're fulfilling the requirement, but we aren't really paying attention to what's going on, even though the speaker was very good. They, they knew that I had some objections about the requirement too, and here I was kind of enforcing it. So I, I was delighted by their contesting this in a way which caught the imagination of people. And we, we finally decided that the requ requirement was not producing uh, whatever it was supposed to accomplish. And I'm not sure what it was supposed to accomplish. But the Druids were in the background. And they were practicing uh, their newfound faith uh, as, a, as a new group. So that was, uh, I think, a way to uh, you know, raise the question of, you don't need to force religion, that there are people who like, take courses in religion or go to church on their own, but the Druids did it in a way that was very effective. And I can't say that they made the difference, but it was good to have a group like that that raised the question. Um, so this is called the, the Book of Cattle Raids, also known as the Book of Reveling. There are, there are scriptures, there are scriptures. I have the book here. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the fascinating things about Druidism. You wouldn't expect a, 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 a tradition like this to have a, a written record. Um, chapter the first. At this pagan spirit gathering of 1993, all the different Druids and neo-pagans did gather together to discuss how to pass the time. As it what's was what's the fascinating sixth, about the, the, the documentary element of, of Druidism is that you can actually look back at these original documents and trace what is essentially a new religious movement from its, its earliest days through all of the growth uh, pains and uh, all of the different phases that it went through. Tony the tailor did suggest that all take their stuffed toy cows, stuffed toy animals, and cowish shaped decorations, and they did have a cattle raiding game. The rules were such. <laughs> Chapter the second. Number one. Only camps with cow-colored uh, banners are playing. fairly eclectic, the group itself. So I think some are finding connection to uh, friends and community, so part of it is about building community. And I think there's a, an element of fun too, so it's also about releasing that energy and, um, and finding ways to connect with other people, or in the case of the Druids, also with um, uh, the rest of creation. I think uh, being out in nature always, through almost every tradition, there has been an element of finding beauty and um, peace and harmony than when, when in nature. Yeah, we appreciate nature, but we don't like, like worship it in some sense of the word, as in like how other religions might perceive worship, but we just try and have fun for the purpose of having fun. It's not really a religion, but it's most similar to one. It's spiritual, but not 
We aren't being told what to do. The honoring of our relationship to the environment, the inseparability really of human beings and other forms of existence from that environment is a truth that we are now understanding in ways in which we really haven't before. I think the Druid values are eternal and I think they will always apply to Carleton student life and I think most people can say that they felt like they've always been Druids, they just didn't know what word to place upon that feeling. <laughs>